Welcome to Unexpectedly Homeschooling. My name is Jana Cook and I'm the Community Manager for Bookshark. This is session one in literature-based learning, Is It Right for You and Your Child? Today I'm joined with Lynn Woodley. She is the product expert with Bookshark. We're gonna be talking about the natural approach that literature-based learning brings. Welcome, Lynn. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thank you so much for joining me today. Would you like to start by just telling us a little bit about yourself and how your experience personally with literature-based learning has brought you to this place? All right, awesome, thank you. So in 2001, I started homeschooling. Um, unbeknownst to me that I would even uh, consider that. It, it really had to do with a neighbor who was using uh, you know, the company and the cur curriculum and invited me to a, a park play day. Um, and that's where my homeschooling journey actually began. So as I was homeschooling and using this philosophy for language arts, it was just a really wonderful um, journey to see the, the whole setup and how it went. Um, when I was teaching it, it was like, okay, I wasn't taught that way, but let's, let's do it this way because I know it builds on itself. It, it grows, they have the developers, they are going with it, they know what they're doing. So I'm not going to second guess it. So as I work through, um, it, I, I laid it out like, they, like it was laid out and um, actually have a best friend who homeschooled also from high school, my best friend from high school. And she called a couple of years later and said, is this how we were taught? And I said, no, it isn't, but it's awesome. And so it's a beautiful way to do it. As we went through, I could see, I could see the benefits of it and how it was blessing um, the education in, in language arts, which is really a difficult course um, to teach uh, because we, we put on our own feelings of writing, we put on our own. And then when your child is writing and you criticize their work, that it's everybody takes it personally. So, you know, a couple things that I learned along the way is step back from yourself. Um, let the children express themselves. Don't correct mispronunciation or mis, misspellings or, or um, just all the mechanics of language. Don't correct that when they're writing when they're writing a story, because then you squish their creativity. Um, you want them to be really creative. You can do the language mechanics and the other pieces of the learning of our approach. Uh, so as I walked along with it and my son got older, I was shocked at his writing and how well he did it. It's like, oh my goodness, he didn't get that from me. So he got it from the program. Um, and then at one point he had to submit a writing and the, the lady, we were in there with him and the lady said, did you really write this? <laughs> and, you know, he said, yes, you know, and then I saw his work in college and it was just amazing because um, I learned from it, got better in my writing skills as we went along, because that's the benefit and the beauty of homeschooling. But as we went along, I could see that he was a far better writer than I ever have been. So it's at a younger age, you know, so it's an awesome way. So I would really like to describe what the natural approach is today because um, it's a different way to teach. It's a different philosophy, but such an effective philosophy that I think sometimes we are, we, we put ourselves in an educational box and can't think outside of the way that we were taught or that the public schools are teaching and think that that's the only way. So in this, in this presentation, I hope to be able to give your viewers um, the ability to think outside that box, to see that this approach is very successful. I've not only seen it in my own family, but at, through those years, I was a consultant with thousands of families using our program and, um, and saw the results of and in their test taking with states, you know, with, with Oregon, I live in Oregon, with Oregon, we had to test third, fifth, eighth, and 10th. So you get to see those markers, you get to see how they're doing. And if there's a correction that you need to make, then you can do that. But with this approach, with the natural uh, language approach, it really does help them think more critically, more logically, so that they can assess so many things on so many different levels. So I think what our viewers need to hear is that um, the literature-based learning in a natural approach is not anything new. It has been around for a very long time. 
And it is something that as parents, if we were taught in a public school system in the last 20 to 30 years, 40 to 50, I don't want to not include anyone in this box, but that um, it, it's a different approach than what on our nation has done with education. So we're kind of talking about going back to the basics of this literature-based natural approach. So Lynn, go ahead and start with, um, where did this start? Where did this come from? All right. Um, actually, Dr. Ruth Bichick is, is the, the uh, PhD person who really got um, this approach going. And so our company, um, had her come in and actually help us develop the language arts years ago. Um, and then she came in a couple different times to help refresh because sometimes, you know, our, we would start um, adding some things in and she would say, no, 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 no. You know, you, you need to get, stay with the basics. And so um, with that approach, um, I, I have, I can show you and talk to you about her whole philosophy. One of the things that she says is, Workbooks is not where children learn how to write, simply is not how. So she also um, looks at, at Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin learned how to do this. So it really is a simple approach to teaching your children how to write, how to communicate. So what is it we really are looking for when we are teaching language arts? That's one of the questions I would have all the parents uh, look at. What is it that is the goal Deep down, it is communication. We want to teach our children how to communicate on a higher level. Verbs, a verbiage with, with our words, with our typing, with our writing, um, with all of it. So in that approach, it's the natural approach. So Dr. Ruth Bichek says, from what you read or what you hear is what you'll copy and what you will then write. And then you just keep copying and writing and, and reviewing what you've, you've, what you've written. Benjamin Franklin would write, copy, he'll, he would read, and then he would sit down and write, copy those passages. And then he would try to do it on his own and copy them and then put them down and then come back later and look at it and see, okay, what did I do wrong? What did I not put in there? How did I not make it right? And then he would redo it again. And he would do the same thing over until he felt that he had perfected it. So it's just like any other subject, like math, you have to practice. Piano, you have to practice. Art, you have to practice. Uh, reading, you have to practice. Just the same with language arts. You just keep going back and touching. So when we as parents are reading to them, um, they are hearing. So some of the exercises that we have in our program might be from the history that they're learning. Um, at the younger ages, it's from what they are reading so that they can visually see, because that puts a place in your mind. Um, and if you are having them read it out loud, they're also hearing it. And then they get to look at the copy work in, on their activity sheet. And you, you talk to them about reading it. Oh yeah, we remember we, you read that passage in that book. Okay, let's look at the punctuation. Let's review this. Let's see where where's the capitalizations? Where are the where are the all the mechanics of it? Like the commas, the periods, the question marks, um, the attributions, all of those things. Then you get to go over that with them. And in our guide, there are sections that are like in yellow, and that's a script. So. You can read that if you need to help assist you through that, or you can read it on your planning day and know what it says and then verbally say it the way you want to say it. So you get to have that guide pacing you through, helping you to, to help your children understand. A lot of times what I see though is that parents don't see the value of the copy work or dictation. When they're younger, it's copy work. When, it, when they're older, it's dictation. Don't take your children too quickly into dictation. Allow them to be able to see it and copy it. If they're not ready to move on to dictation, even when we say they're ready to move on to dictation, don't, don't move them there. Let, let them copy it still because you want to be able to have them be confident in it. Dictation is not an easy thing. And it's, you know, years ago, 
you know, it was taught in school. You had to learn how to take dictation. And there's some people that could do it really fast, really well. Um, I wasn't one of those, <laughs> you know, so it's like, okay, slow down, slow down. So that's one thing too, that you want to do. If your child is balking a little bit at it, perhaps you're in a language arts that's a little bit too advanced for them. At our lower level, three levels of history, we have five different levels of language arts for this very reason. Um, just because you have a child that's read early, they have not had any mechanics teaching. So that's where we don't want to really advance them just because of the reading level. We want to look at the mechanics level. So you really want to have them in a, a place because Dr. Ruth Pichik was not about pushing through and saying early readers are not, you know, are not all that it's not that advent, advantageous to do that because they're missing the learning opportunities by trying to decipher the words. And when they're trying to decipher the words, they're not really learning the mechanics. So it takes away that natural approach. So you really want to be able to just follow your children's lead, ha have them help you understand, are they really ready for this mechanically? That's really where we should look first. Um, is mechanically, where do they sit? Um, because the, once you push them on this topic, because I don't know about you, Jana, but for me, um, language arts was not necessarily always a fun thing. Was it for you? I actually loved diagramming sentences. <laughs> so I'm not a good example. <laughs> there you go. So you're one of those. Yes. Okay, there we go. So she liked doing that. But when you're younger and you're just learning that, if you have a teacher or whoever's leading the education, pushing it too hard, you're, you're going to burn them out. Yeah. So take time, take time for that and allow them to do that, um, that copy work over and over again. One of the things in this natural approach to learning that I liked to do and I learned was better to do when I was teaching it is on that Sunday night planning time, I got to see what the writing exercise was for the week what the different um, pieces are were. So Monday morning, I would say, okay, writing this week, it's going to be a, a journal entry about your dog or about, you know, whatever the topic is. So that all the time, you know, and we're going to hit first, the first time on it is on Thursday, and then Friday is going to be, you know, the final copy. So that allowed him to think, okay, I've got to do a journal entry. It gives you time to chew on it, even subconsciously. Mm -hmm. You know, It's not that he's going to be thinking, okay, now I got to write about this. Now I got to write about this. It's just that you've given the opportunity to tell what is coming up so that it's not just bam, here it is. This is what you have to do. So that's kind of that natural approach too. So a lot of people will say to us, you don't get enough grammar. You just barely touch on it. You, you um, just do it and then move on. You ask maybe one question. That's part of that natural approach. Grammar, I, I read on a, a report years ago, so I don't know where that report is anymore. I'd have to do a lot of research again. But in that report, um, I read about the developing brain. The developing brain in young, in young human beings is amazing and it's interesting and what I read in that report is that the brain is not developed to a point to be able to master grammar until they are 11 or 12. So anything that you do prior to that is going to be memory, not mastery. So you might be able to get them to understand what a noun is. They might not know what it is for the first year. They might not be able to recall and tell you. So that's one of the things that I find is a frustration for families is that they think that we should hit on nouns, 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 and then so their child could know what that is and be able to have it mastered when truthfully their brain is not able to do that. So we really start pushing a little bit more grammar like uh, with Grammar Ace first, and then I recommend you go to uh, Winston Grammar Basic and then Advanced, kind of when they're 10, you know, start doing each one of those pieces. So don't just allow that natural approach because what they've read today, there will be examples of, you know, an adverb or a verb or a noun. So allow that to be that. And okay, we touched on it today. And then maybe two weeks we touch on it again. And you could say, oh, do you remember 
remember in that sentence, you can reshow that to them. Mm -hmm. So remember that it's just that natural, soft, gentle approach from what they've read or what they've heard to what they've copied to what they've maybe perhaps have, have written in dictation. Then they can start applying it in their own written activities so that it just keeps moving on. This is what creates good communicators because how better to learn from the best writers? And we, in our books, we have a lot of award-winning books and that purpose is so that you can see um, good writing pieces in there and good usage of those diagram sentences that you, you love to do, Jenna. Uh, yes. So yeah, so it's, it's an awesome piece to be able to just allow them to, to flow gently and naturally through. Um, so it, it's like if you were to sit down and, um, and, and I were to teach you art, because you're an adult, are you going to be able to do a Michelangelo painting in the first sitting? No. <laughs> so are you saying art is not one of yours, Jana? So anyway, art, I believe everybody can do just like writing. It, but it takes that practice and that review and that introduction from great writers all over um, and, and to um, really understand and learn from them. Well, and I think you make a good point, and that's what literature-based learning is really how it starts before your children can even start to form letters on a page or maybe even recognize sounds you're reading to them literature that is works of art we're, we're looking at books that have been given awards for certain reasons there's so much information out there in our day and age i feel like um we are inundated right we almost have so much information that we really have to be pick and choose. And so when you have a, an award-winning book, you know that there are people that vetted it and that they have done the research that says, these are the reasons this book is a classic. I hear often parents um, balk a little bit that their children don't like to read. And I think my response to them is, are you reading to them? Maybe they're not ready to do the independent readers of those chapter books. One of my twins was not getting through chapter books until she was almost 13. And last year, she actually read over 12 novels. So I think that that idea of the natural approach is being read to. I was fortunate enough to have a mother who loved to read. So we were read to all the time up until into our teenage years. My mom would still read us the classics, yes. Little House in the Prairie, um, ones like that, that we remember. And it developed a love not only for reading, but it naturally flowed into a love for writing because you were given an example of the beauty of how you could communicate your thoughts, your imagination and put it down on paper for others to be able to experience with you. Exactly. It's the mimicking. It's the mimicking of what you're hearing. And um, it, it's the same like with music, what, what you listen to comes out, you know, what you read comes out. And that's one of the beautiful things, too, that, that I want to share here is that when you read these awesome novels that are in our, our uh, curriculum, they learn empathy and compassion, you know, and so that's going to show also in their writing. So just like your children when they're young, they learn a language naturally because mm -hmm. you talk to them, mm -hmm. you, you, you talk with inflection. When, when they're babies, you know, you talk to them, they can't talk back to you yet, but boy, are they learning because they are taking in and you are teaching them a foreign language, which is English, you know, it's there, but it's foreign to them at the beginning. They can tell love and emotion from your, from your expression. Mm -hmm. So that's also where they learn expression in writing. And that's where they learn it from the novels as well. So by being exposed, like you're, you're talking about, is, is teaching them how to mimic um, what they hear and um, write what they hear from those good models um, and trying to, to have that come out in their own writing because, and it's not by pushing. Um, so I know that some people say, oh, my, my child can't can't write about what you're asking him to write about. 
um, but he could write about Mario and uh, Minecraft and any other things that they play with. Well, why is that? Mm -hmm. It's because they're playing it all the time. They hear it all the time. So just keep introducing this other venue of education in these awesome books, and they will start mimicking that as well. If they're balking at it, perhaps again, I will say, you've put them too high in our language arts because of perhaps their reading level. If you need to place them, and you can look at our scope and sequence, if you need to place them lower than their reading ability, which I don't think is a problem, then you just boost their reading by taking them to the library. Any reader will not balk at you for saying, hey, do you wanna go pick up some books at the library? Just have them read the ones that go with their lessons so that they are listening, hearing, reading in their mind and copying what they're, what they're learning. So it's all just a process. The thing that I've always said to, to parents when I'm consul um, consulting with them is if you miss these, uh, these mechanics of language at their younger ages, they are going to continue to have those holes because these are the basic fundamentals that they need to build off of. And so they need to have that there. So putting them too high causes them to not enjoy it, perhaps, to say that they're bored, to say that they want to write something else because they're not grasping. It's over their ability. And that's not a, that's not a bad thing. It's just where they are. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's like, I, I will tell them when they're 18, nobody is going to know where they are in language arts when they're eight or nine. Nobody's mm -hmm. gonna know. You know, like your 13 year old daughter, nobody's gonna know. And I applaud that you didn't push that because that she was take, she was actually absorbing more learning by not having to read herself or really want to read herself because she was listening and taking in. And that's what happens with those early readers. They're so busy deciphering that the, the later reader is learning, learning life and learning um, like science or learning other things while this other one is deciphering mm -hmm. and really graining. So when that later to read child does learn how to read and does want to read, they they might already know how to read, but they don't have that desire or love right. yet. Mm -hmm. You know, so when they do, their comprehension level is so much higher before than the other child that when they start reading, they just soar. They soar. And you've seen that. Absolutely. <laughs> and then she that. actually has a twin sister who was opposite of her, who loved to read, who was pouring through books. I couldn't get books fast enough into her hands. And, um, there was that feeling of, am I, am I doing something wrong? Is something wrong with me? Because we are the same age. We're the same gender. We're in the same classes, but I, I'm not like her. And it was a beautiful, um, example of, no, you are, you get to be who you are. And so I think to just really encourage the parents who are watching this, like I had two in my household that could have been compared and contrasted so carefully and um, just really giving you permission that it, it doesn't have to look that way. Your child is not going to look like anybody else's child, not even gonna look like their sibling. And that's okay. We are all uniquely and wonderfully made. And as parents, when we can accept that and take the pressure off of ourselves, from feeling like, is my child behind? Is something wrong with my child? Now, obviously, if you do find that there is something that needs extra help with a child, we are encouraging you to look for that help. But in just a naturally, children are gonna develop in different time, at different times in different areas. And so looking at my two, I just kept encouraging my daughter that you don't have to look the same. You guys are different and you're gonna learn differently and you're both brilliant. And it just comes out in different ways. And I think parents really need to hear that from um, other homeschool parents, from professionals in the industry to just know that if you're reading to your child, say a 13, 14, 15 year old is not interested in independent reading, take the time to just start reading it to them. 
audiobooks are a wonderful option because like Lynn is saying, there are possibly some holes that are never going to get filled if we just keep pushing them forward. So we can get outside of this box that we think it should look this way or it should go this way or we follow the path of A, B, and C, sometimes we jump from A to D and circle back to B and C, and that's okay. And that's yeah. encouragement just to know that you're doing, you're doing okay. Yeah. And I, I like that too. And, and that's really what I try to push. And that's what I try to say to them is that you don't need to be at a certain place when they're younger. You just need to be where they are mm -hmm. because they will, they will do it at their pace um, and that's where the beauty of homeschooling comes in, is that there's not going to be a label on your child. Nobody needs to know, has to know if they are behind what somebody thinks they should be, because they're not behind. They're where they're at. So um, I would encourage all of you to um, remove the negative uh, labels um, don't say that they're behind because they're not. They're just placed where they are. Um, nobody has to know, not even your friends, not even your family, if they can't accept it, that a child is taking a little longer to, to read. Mm -hmm. They don't have to know where they're at. That's the beauty of the lettering of what we have is that it's not a grade. It's an age range. Now, our lower level language arts do have the grade reading ability on there, but don't look at that. Just look at where they are to read and then just do those. And then, but again, look more at the mechanics piece because you really want that approach, this natural approach to be able to just naturally move along. At some point, um, we probably will do, or I'll probably do, I, Jan and I might do a just a language arts uh, lesson to go over. We might have it on YouTube at some point, um, in our boot camp at some point for those new homeschooling families, just to help you understand a little bit better. But for this, we are just telling you that the natural approach really is a solid, very solid approach. Um, you will create children who can cognitively, logically think through uh, life, have compassion and empathy, just because of the, the manner of the philosophy. One of the things I would encourage you to do potentially is go to the library and see if you can check out the three R's uh, book that Dr. Ruth Beechick uh, wrote years ago. Um, she was a wonderful woman and, and very knowledgeable and understood um, the learning part of, of the brain of the child and the development of the child. So I love this approach. It was not the approach I knew or understood. So I just followed the awesome notes that we have. And some might look at it because it isn't the norm and they haven't stepped outside their box. They might think it's different or mm -hmm. they don't quite understand it. That's where I would say, go back, reread those first week notes, understand the pre-notes, the post notes in all of it before you teach it. And then every week, just be prepared for, for that because it is different. Just like when I taught um, Singapore math, this is just an, an, an analogy of the same. I wasn't taught the Singapore method. So I would have to read the home instructor's guide that I got with it. And it's like, oh, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> um, you know, and then I would teach that to him. And then I would also put in there if there was a piece that I, the way I learned it, over time, I realized that the Singapore method was easy. In fact, there was a, a, an a exercise in, oh, I think it was 5B, that um, our, my son's dad, when he came home for dinner that night, um, he's an engineer type and has that kind of degree. And I said, okay, you're going to sit down together side by side and do this pro problem. And he kept looking at our son's paper. And I said, no, don't cheat. Don't look at it. And, and our son got it done in half the time because of the method. And, and he, he, they both got the right answer, but it took him twice as long as an adult right. with a degree to do that. So again, it's a different method, just like this language arts uh, natural approach is a different method. So I just say, open your eyes to it, understand it, follow it. It works. Um, and once you see them testing, you're going to see that it works. Um, it just 
it, it has all the components that you need to teach. And again, the copy work dictation is key. It's key to this approach because they are learning those, those mechanics in their copy work. They're learning grammar in their copy work without it being exact. And like Dr. Ruthie Chick said, workbooks do not teach children how to write. So this approach does. And you think about copy work when you're thinking of um, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, age ranges, you know, five to eight, nine. Um, I think back to those times where there was copy work, right? We copied the lines. Um, the beauty of literature based learning is that they are copying something that they've already heard. It has context. It's a story that they're connected to. And so, again, that idea that public school systems are set up in a way for the masses, right? And there's, we're not speaking negatively at all about that setup. What we're saying is that's not a necessity. And when you bring your child out of that programming into a home setting, you think about, um, you know, when you're teaching your child anything, it's, you're not teaching a class of 30, right? You're teaching to, in, to the individual. And so I think that, again, it reinforces that natural approach that you're just talking to your child, you're reading through a story, they're getting excited about the characters, where the story is going to go. And so that copy work isn't just a sentence of a random character or idea. It's pulling them in and connecting them to the story that they already are invested into. Yeah, exactly. Which then comes that that mimic that mm -hmm. that whole you're you're much better. Like um, I'm going to do another another analogy. Like art. If I if I said to you, sit down and I want you to draw the Sistine Chapel, but didn't show you a picture of it. <laughs> you know, I want it, I want you to do it in uh, acrylics. Mm -hmm. So go. Where would you be, Jana? In you know? a corner crying. <laughs> Yes, and that's that's sometimes sadly where some people go with a, a topic that they don't understand. So sometimes we as moms, when we're teaching, if we feel a little uncomfortable, then we feel our kids are going to feel uncomfortable. And so children, and you know this when, from, a, from a baby, babies look at mamas and intently take in all expression, all emotion, all feeling. So that same thing is here. So um, just like I tell in, in our boot camp, I tell those new families to homeschooling, step back and reset because your attitude is going to be their attitude. And so if they're, if they're um, acting up or have a bad attitude, look back at yourself and then just tell them, wait a minute, I need a reset. I need to, to restart here and have a, have a change of attitude. Because if we're scared about a topic because we're, we don't really know, um, then then it's going to show. So because this is a different approach that probably most of our families, most of you are not teaching or understanding because it's a different approach, but we have all the material there for you to understand it. We have all of those pieces, all of it written down. So just, I would just encourage people using our language arts to review all the notes. We have all kinds of notes in there and understand to understand it all and just be ready through the week. Um, and then be open with your children about what's going to happen for the week. Um, talk to them about what, what the overview is. There's an overview in there. There's rubrics in there. I, I, the rubrics are for the written activities. So I would encourage you to share the rubrics with the children so that they know what is going to be expected of them. Mm -hmm. Don't just pop it on them. Share it. Share it all say, okay, this is what, when, when we're going to review your writing, this is what we need to review. Even have them check the review then once they do it, have them go back the next day or the next week and say, okay, this rubric says I need to have done this. Did I do that? That's going to be also that learning process. That's exactly what Benjamin Franklin did. He would put it away, come back a week later, a day later and review what he had done. So that's all that natural approach. It doesn't sometimes feel like you're doing much. Mm -hmm. That's kind of some of that problem. You know, parents don't see a worksheet done, you know, that, that's there. But it's the process that's getting you to the point that the children is growing and learning. And um, I think and one of our goals is to create lifelong learners. 
And Mm -hmm. so as we're going through this process, I think when parents are uncomfortable with something that they don't quite understand, it's a beautiful opportunity to say, you know what? I'm not quite sure. Let me look back. Let me see what my instructions are. Let me see, you know, where I need to take a step back and maybe readjust how I'm explaining it to you. Are my children are so good at telling me that I'm not doing it right. Um, And instead of being offended or taken aback by that, I've really had to um, humble myself. I think homeschooling and humility should really be synonymous um, to know that you're right. I I made a mistake there and I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do some research because as an adult, I am still a lifelong learner. And so I'm going to, I'm just going to demonstrate to you. If I don't know something, if I'm uncomfortable with something, this is how you go about learning and then becoming comfortable because as humans, we are uncomfortable with the things that we don't know. If you weren't read to as a child, reading out loud may feel very uncomfortable to you. Um, again, I was fortunate enough to even be in a public education where our teachers read out loud to us. I mean, I could tell you that the Willy Wonka on the chocolate factory, Charlie and the chocolate factory is actually what the book was titled. Um, the different times and how impactful that was for me, even in a classroom setting. So that if that's uncomfortable, again, there are those audiobooks. Um, my youngest sometimes says, is there an audiobook for this? They do the voices better. So there's, <laughs> there are options. And um, Lynn and I had the experience to hear from one uh, parent who said she ships the books to grandma and grandma FaceTimes the books um, to the children so that you're getting intergenerational um, learning. And then, then there's someone else who's helping you. Homeschool is, again, that philosophy that it takes a village. So who can you pull into your village? This all builds on that idea of the natural approach. When you think back to the beginning of time, we didn't have schoolhouses. We didn't have um, specific educators. We had the village and we would farm out the ones who had excellence in these areas. Well, what we, what Bookshark has done in there, they've taken those people who are excelled in these areas. They've put it together for you, knowing that you are not classically trained to teach. Um, And even if you are, we have testimonies from parents who are teachers who use this program, who have, um, great things to say about how it works in their home. So just really want to encourage you that this idea is not new. We didn't come up with it. The natural approach has, we just observed it through time. We've had, um, you know, people come in and, and help us build this curriculum, but it definitely works if you're able to think differently than how maybe you were taught as a child. Yes, exactly. And that that's, Really, the bottom line is is to um, just embrace, embrace it, and see where it takes your children. In the in our instructors' guides, um, there's like I was saying, the pre notes, a lot of notes in the first first week, but also in section three, there's a glossary of things for different levels for you to use as tools. So some of that research can just be in the back of that guide. There's a lot of you know, information for different levels. So like some levels you'll do research papers and it tells, talks to you about how to do those research papers. Sometimes there are grammar um, appendixes in there. So you can look at that. The tools are there. That's one of our philosophies is we want to give you everything that you need Mm -hmm. so that you don't have to go outside and try to gather and find. It really is all there for you. So we don't want you to have to print. We don't want you to have to gather, it's, it truly is all there. And once you do it and your children go to a point where they have to do like state testing, if your, your state requires that of you homeschooling, you're going to see it via the, the scores. The scores are truly amazing. It's, you know, I looked at it and one year he was just the one year that I really focused on is that he um, really scored high. It wasn't that he was all that. I mean, he was grades above his age level. And um, I didn't take that as, oh my goodness, he's just awesome off the wall. It was that, who is he testing against? What have they learned? And how was this approach taught? So it gave me this, the confidence to know that, that this natural approach to learning, to educating history and geography and language arts and science truly works. And it wasn't only my son, it was several several people. There were 104 students in my co-op that I started. 
all of course had to use the same program because I started the co-op. So they were all using it and all doing well. Mm -hmm. And we did have some special needs kids in those in that group too, who also were learning well and learning how to be good citizens in our world. And that's that's I think the key is to this natural approach is that they don't fit inside a box box, but they are able to, to talk to um, adults of any age. You know, they can communicate with older people and they love the communication skills, which is comes back to my first question. What is our goal in teaching this approach to language arts or in teaching language arts is to create good communicators, written, verbally, um, in any, any way, one of those ways, you know, you want to have a good communicator. So I do believe that when you follow our approach, this natural approach to, to language arts that Dr. Ruth Pichek used to promote um, and write about is the, the approach that's very um, well-rounded. It's just not in the box, the typical in the box kind of an approach that most people have, have um, been taught by. Absolutely. Well, Lynn, I want to thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for helping us understand the natural approach, literature-based learning, how it all kind of flows together and works well, um, not only in our program, Bookshark, but also just in reading with your children and starting there. If that's the only thing you get from this session is that please just start looking at reading aloud with your children at any age. We want to thank you. We'll look forward to seeing you in the next session.